So first, uh, thank you very much, Eric, uh, speaking with us. Uh, to start, can you just describe a little bit by, about you, in particular your uh, programming career and uh, what you do with your time, please? Sure. Um, so my name is Eric Hinton. I'm a, I'm a programmer for the New York Times. Uh, I work on the team called uh, Interactive News or Interactive News Development. I'm an interactive news developer, rather. And basically what we, what we do is we are a desk in the newsroom. We're not uh, like it, like a separate floor or a separate team or anything like that, but we actually sit in the newsroom and we work with news desks to create interactive content for um, uh, stories and packages and other things we're covering. We do a lot around the Olympics, a lot around elections, mm -hmm. uh, Oscars, big, big kind of recurring events like right. that. Um, but we also do smaller one-off pieces. Um, you know, we do a lot of a lot of things about like wars and debates and things like sure. that. Um, previous to working at the Times, I worked for a political blog called Talking Points Memo, sure. um, where I kind of uh, ran the the whole site and did mm -hmm. some development uh, around uh, tools. Right. For them. right. Okay. Great. And, and uh, sounds like you are a programming language maven of some sort, including Haskell. Tell me about the the kind of uh, experience you have with different languages and. In particular, Haskell, I guess, and why? Why did you get turned on to Haskell? Seems like. So um, um, I started programming uh, when I was pretty young. Uh, I, I started programming like a lot of people did in like Logo and Basic. Um, my dad uh, in the early '90s like taught some computer classes, and mm -hmm. um, they were doing Basic and Logo, Logo and that stuff. And so I started programming, obviously, um, with him and uh, making little text adventure games. Um, and then that kind of went dormant for a while. Uh, in college, I got a job. Um, well, all throughout college, I thought I was going to, going to be a video editor. Um, so I actually learned how to program through, through having to program my compositing software and my animation software. And that was done in a variant of JavaScript. Um, but uh, so I was exposed to JavaScript and ActionScript and py Python through that uh, and Lua because mm -hmm. all, all everything had a different every different program was scripted with a different language. Um, so I, right. I got a pretty pretty quick experience with a lot of different languages. And then I, when I started doing news development work, I started using Ruby a lot in addition to JavaScript. But it all, right. my love affair with Haskell all began at a hackathon where my friends and I were trying to implement a, a, a map simplifier to simplify map shapes. And mm -hmm. uh, an SVG, SVG simplifier, actually. But so, you know, say a state has like 8,000 points, it's very hard to draw that. Right. So you run a little algorithm on it to take mm -hmm. off, you know, you know, small details, right? So I tried to do that in Ruby and um, wrote what I thought was a pretty clever, clever algorithm. And it was like, you know, stack overflow, crash, you know, it was, it was, it was seg mm -hmm. call. I don't know. A lot of bad things happened. And that was, that was when I was like kind of, cruelly and you know uh, introduced to the uh, issues of issues of resource management and computers and speed and things like that so one of my friends just mentioned like why don't you right. try haskell i think as a joke um just in the sense of you know uh, i don't think a lot of people usually usually hear oh something didn't work in ruby you should immediately try haskell as the next the next step but i i really um was right. kind of attracted to exactly. it because i had done a lot of uh i done a lot of logic and uh abstract algebra work, both in college and after um, college. I was interest, interested right. in those. And uh, Haskell mapped on to that, um, those concepts really nicely. So it, it just seemed right. like, this, like this kind of um, powerful right. arcane tool. I got really into it. Um, and I've been programming Haskell now for almost as long as I've been programming in Ruby. Um, um, so about, uh, so about years. four years. Right, OK. All right, cool. And uh, we'll come back to that a little bit and then see your uh efforts sure. to increase the presence with the New York Times. And uh, yes. so let's talk about the Fashion Week uh, project that uh, this is the subject today. Uh, how, how did that come about as far as your design, design overview and architecture and tool chain? Um, so uh, is, that, on, is that all yours or what? To start, the if you look at the Fashion Week in a page inter, uh, interactive, there's two, two parts. There's like a fisheye kind of viewer of the clothes um, of like eight collections at the top. And then there are like fingerprints at the bottom, and my my part was mm -hmm. finger fingerprints at the bottom. Um, uh, and they actually turned out to be kind of small, uh, right, right. Um, uh, just because of internal discussions about how best to, to cover the material and resource allotment and things like that. characters and built them out of like little Lego stacks. 
and showed how even with just blocks, most of these cartoon characters you could pick out just based on the color bars. And that was where it really clicked for me. I was like, what if I could reduce uh, an outfit to its color bars? Mm -hmm. How um, cynic dokal could that kind of be um, for the collection um, as a whole and the dress itself? So that was kind of the inspiration behind it. I really wanted a way to quickly kind of scan lots of dresses and um, uh, make kind of less emotional and more kind of hard, you know, judgments about fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's how the concept started. As far as Haskell, I knew from the beginning that I, I pretty much wanted to use Haskell. I, I, I made a prototype in Ruby just as kind of like a, I wonder if I could even graph these things, but mm -hmm. I, I really quickly had the problem of, you know, I have 7,000 photos for each fashion week. Um, I think that's about the right number. And each photo is like uh, 640 by 480. And just oh. mapping all of over of all those pixels and doing averaging and doing, um, uh, I eventually did some more statistical methods, which I can go into more detail if you want to, uh, to actually make the bars take out some of the noise. Uh -huh. It just got very, very, very slow. And uh -huh. it was hard to control resources. Um, you know, I had to make, you know, just to make sure all the files were closed and everything uh -huh. was kind of stored in a nice tight, um, you know, format um, in memory. Because the, the, pro the nice thing is, is each one can kind of be analyzed by itself. So you mm -hmm. can kind of process one and then hand that off, um, close all the resources off and go into the next one. But it has to be fast enough that I could keep tuning small things because it wasn't like there wasn't a manual, right? That was like how to analyze dresses for color. I knew I'd have to mm -hmm. take a lot of methods from other kind of fields of computer vision and art. Um, so I knew I'd be making a lot of changes and it took so long in Ruby to analyze even one collection. Now, as long as that. Excuse me? How long is that? Um, so I ran the initial Ruby script, which didn't even do a lot of the complicated math that the Haskell one ended up doing on one collection. And it took about like, uh, I want to say somewhere in the order of like 10 minutes to, to, to process through one collection. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the Haskell eventually took about 15 minutes total. But I don't really entirely want to compare the Ruby to the Haskell, right? Because I, the Haskell I was using incredibly, you know, performant and right. refined, you know, libraries and uh, methods and, and things like that. Whereas I spent very little time on the Ruby. I just wanted to see if I could even graph them, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just spit out the HTML. But it, I knew pretty quickly that, you know, doing pixel by pixel level manipulation on pictures in Ruby was never going to be fast without right. some sort of C binding. Um, and I right. wasn't about to, to start that. Right. Right. So would you say then the, the, what Haskell gave you enabled this application? Had Haskell not been there, what would have been your choices? Use some so, other language you think and do it or not do this approach with such, such high quality or what? I think that if I was better at um, you know, something like C, um, I, I probably could have um, written this um, reasonably well in C, but... Um, you know, I was most of the 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 program itself was kind of based off of white papers. Um, one was a statistical white paper about one dimensional K means algorithms, and then a bunch were white papers about uh, uh, and academic papers as well about uh, color analysis and color mm -hmm. distance. And um, you know, it, it was just so easy to translate that into the Haskell because it's you know, uh, I mean. This is a syntactical consideration rather than any kind of hard limitation, but just very simple to kind of translate, you know, mathematical text into into Haskell it ends up looking very similar. Right. Um, that it made that process a lot easier. I, I think that again, I could have obviously I could have done it in something like C, um, but it probably I don't know. I, I would have lost a lot of the the ease of abstraction. There's and and also I can't say enough about how the Haskell libraries, uh, such as, you know, Haskell's vector and REPA libraries, uh, really were a godsend because of just, you know, the sheer volume of, of pixels. Um, it just made it really, really, it was a very useful abstraction. And I, and, you know, I don't know where else I could have found that. Right. So it's made for those, REPA is you know, made for something like this. Yeah, I mean, I think I think all, almost every example I've seen of, of Repa's use has been with image data, and I think for good reason. Um, you know, when you're dealing with a 400 by 480 by 600 matrix or whatever. You have a statement here that uh, seems you know very uh, eye-catching. Uh, 
we quote it as the difference between analysis happening in 15 minutes or two hours, which is the speed of Haskell prior to my user repo, is cool with 75 hours development. Yep. Okay. So that so 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 it's contributed to repo then the, the, the difference. Yes. Right. I mean, okay. it's, I mean, and and again, you know, when people see that, it's like, well, yeah, you could just. I wouldn't have to be there for the, those two hours, right? I could just, right. you know, put it on some server. And a lot of people nowadays say, like, you, you know, they like to cite things like, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil and things like that. But, um, but the thing that I found is, you know, we are news developers often working from place to place, like on trains. A lot of this was developed like over Christmas, or a Christmas break in Connecticut, right? Mm -hmm. Like. You know, the whole tool chain of like VPNing into our servers, you know, running them on Amazon, things like that, just isn't as practical when you're doing this kind of experimental work, right? It was incredibly useful that I ran all this on my laptop, right? right. And, you know, I was able to do these kind of, you know, yeah, I probably could have taken some unoptimized Ruby code, put it on like a 32 core compute cluster on Amazon or whatever, and gotten somewhat, you know, similar performance even without REPA um, uh, in Haskell. Um, but, I would have really sacrificed the flexibility of being able to just constantly be tweaking this as I'm, you know, going from place to place, riding on a subway, riding on a train, or even just, you know, um, not having to have these expensive servers spun up for all this time. It, it really, uh, it took a, a, an incredible amount of development time away, and it, it allowed me to iterate very fast because right. if I could, if I could run the whole collection right, which I had to do because, you know, just to give you, you know, just to give you a little, uh, sort of like. This is like kind of the, the scope of it that we're looking yeah, at, right? right uh -huh. <laughs> um, to uh, to be able to adjust the quality, I had to be able to see that whole scope, right? right. So right. I had to run the whole thing each time, you know. Right. And uh, it was very useful to be able to tweak, wait five to ten minutes, you know, for maybe a subset of it, or maybe even the whole thing um, right. sometimes. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, yes, that was very profoundly useful. <laughs> so is is the current. Um form of, of this application the first time it's been done that way? Or is it you, you started this a couple of times ago? Um, it's been, a, I mean, the actual current version of the code that's running is, it, you know, it's the same file more or less that I started with um, two years ago. But it's okay. just, you know, as I've gotten better with Haskell and um, as I've kind of uh, refined some of, of the techniques, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's changed a little bit, but it's it's actually the same the same file. It's not even that many lines of code. It's it's probably five hundred to a thousand. That's it. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So that's another one of the advantages of Haskell is just the conciseness of the whole thing. Right, and I mean, and you know, there's a lot that can be said for just having to move one file around, you know? I mean, obviously I use the Cabal tool chain um, to, you know, move it from my home computer to, to my work computer and, you know, do all the dependency work, right? And that was, that was useful as well. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot that is gained by just having a single file rather than having, you know, an entire directory or, you know, or, or, or repo. Obviously it's easy to check out. It's easy to clone things with Git, you know, I, and I have no problems with doing all of that. But it's it's a lot. It's also very easy to sell somebody on. Oh, what's that? What's this new experimental thing you're trying? Oh, don't worry, it's just a file. It, yeah, it's right. not entirely different than a make script or something like that, right? right. Okay. It, there's something less intimidating about uh, mm -hmm. uh, about that. Although that's just psychological. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have to sell this this concept to the uh, your bosses and other people and say what are you doing? What? Um, they kind of took the tack of um, I really like what's coming out. Just don't tell me how you got it. <laughs> right, yeah. um, to a certain extent, at first, at least. I mean, obviously, the concern with something like uh, an experimental, at least experimental opera, you know, from the viewpoint of the New York Times um, language is that if it doesn't work and you're sick, you know, the dead, fashion week isn't going to change, right? It's right. not, not going to move the deadline back, you know, or if you, you know, the election might, isn't going to move. But um, so how can someone else, you know, kind of uh, work with this if you're not there and you can't do it? Because um, there's no one else here that really knows Haskell very well. Um, but being an off, I was able to sell it to them and kind of introduce it there by piecemeal um, by selling them on the idea of it's an offline script is you know doing this kind of hard work 
um, not either either offline or independent of the actual application that's serving out um, the you know the data to the users because it gets people a lot less antsy about you know it being in production. Right. Right. But once once you develop it, then what's the deployment environment like? How do you deploy this into your uh, sort of architecture in 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 your section? So I mean uh, the deployment. I actually didn't have to deploy this this program. This program okay. ran locally, and part of it was that it pushed the results up to uh, up to S three, um, and right. then a different app consumed them. Okay, okay. So now this so this whole application now is a uh, until you find something really really much better would be the ongoing for Fashion Week, right? Um, yeah, I mean, we just, it's funny, actually, right before this, uh, this interview, I was actually in a meeting about what we're going to do for next Fashion Week. Right, um, okay. I, you know, uh, part of this was selling them on this idea that these fingerprints are compelling, right? right. That it's a, it's a good, it's a good metaphor. Uh, it's a good visualization. Right. Um, now that people like them, uh, then the question becomes much more interesting from my point of view because now we might have to talk about, okay, we, we might actually directly tie this into our content. So then I will ha actually having, you know, maybe have to have run this on a, some sort of server or some sort of online process so that we can immediately when a show comes in, you know, kind of, you know, bake it through, um, you know, uh, through our live servers rather than having to just basically run it on a cron locally. Mm, okay. Well, I can see potentially... You know, maybe advertising, what have you. Click on that dress. What's that dress like? And then, you know, you guys want to sell advertising to that particular designer or something. You know, sure. I mean, you know, there, there are news issues there, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we, we, that's we've, true. Done this, yes. we've done some of this before, before, right. um, but um, with like books. Uh, and, but um, there's, you know, there always is the integrity of news, which comes first. Um, right. You know, we don't want to compromise any of that. Well, although the church and state uh, divider is, uh, you know, sometimes porous at times. You know, exactly. No, absolutely. Yeah, and, right. and I think, I think that, you know, again, it's fashion. You know, it's not it's right. not politics or something like that. So we have a lot more freedom. Right. Interesting. Okay. So, what are some any any lessons this time around, or just through the whole whole project cycle at the beginning? Anything surprising beyond your under expectations? What Haskell could do for you? Um, you know, the thing that is always interesting to me, and it's something that. It's something that is frustrating, but is ultimately, uh, uh, I don't know, I've come to, I've come to some sort of peace or even a liking of, enough, is uh, the, at least for me, the process of developing a Haskell app for the Times, this is, this is, I'm actually on my third or fourth one actually now um, for the Times in Haskell, um, is, is you'll write the app and it will work reasonably well. But then the, you will realize there's a resource problem. Um, some, usually, usually it's uh, some sort of memory leak or something like that. Um, but I become really comfortable, large, largely as a result of this project, with diagnosing those things. And the Haskell memory profiling tools um, are, are inc pretty incredible, actually. Um, and I'm usually able to, to, to find the cause of that. Um, but one thing that I would have done differently that I've, not, I've, I've gotten, become much, you know, kind of more... Uh, comfortable with since then is just uh, I've been using conduits for a lot of my kind of resource limited or when I want to control how much resource I use um, if I'm opening thousands and thousands of files and then closing them immediately. And I think I would have liked to rewrite this in that way because I had to be very careful that all my methods let go of, of the the files they were processing so I didn't build up these huge uh, you know, this huge amount of, of information in residence that it couldn't let go of even after the file was, file was gone. Um, that that was a, a, a sticking point that I had with analyzing these files. They'd open up the, the picture um, and then, they, you know, they would do its processing on it and then put the picture away, but it would still sometimes hold on to some of that data, um, you know, from the picture and sometimes times the whole picture itself because something was lazy or something like that. So always the, the, the memory battle with laziness is something that is, uh, is difficult in Haskell, but um, it's honestly generally once you solve it, you solve it for the, you know, for the rest of that app. Um, and it, it only gets easier every time it, it's, it's a little quicker. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's where laziness is, is, uh -huh. is causing me a problem. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. Okay. So then could you generalize a little bit on the, the best uses for Haskell then? And uh, I think you also had a quote that you, uh, what is it, that uh, 
you immediately drop into, into a Haskell whenever I need to do anything that operates a lot of data or model or some yeah. aspect space, space and process. Um, so, yeah, sure. Can you elaborate um, on that? So sometimes with the price of the flexibility of um, and the ease of writing of something like Ruby um, or Python, both both languages which I, which I really really like and enable us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do here otherwise. Um, the price though, though of their flexibility is you often jump into um, solving a problem before before you fully understand the space that the problem lives in. Um, a good example is I. I was writing this this little uh, what I thought was going to be a simple algorithm in, in in a Ruby app for we had like a photo competition where we could schedule meetings with individual photographers to have their work reviewed by our editors and and other photo editors. Um, but the problem was that I jumped into writing the solution in Ruby so fast, and I was able to start writing so much code that eventually that pretty quickly I realized wasn't going to solve the problem. But there wasn't any, you know, Haskell forces you in a, to think in advance of the space. You know, what is this going to produce use? Or is, can I assume that if I feed this thing into it, I will always get this thing out or, or whatnot? And, you know, just because of those kind of formal restrictions, it makes me really tease out, like, what is actually happening to my data? So, uh, for instance, in the Fashion Week thing, I, I had to think in, in advance, like, what was going to be the input and output of every picture? Was I going to, to was each picture going to be, you know, uh, produce an array of, of values? Was it going to, you know, produce some sort of special stru structure? And how would that influence then the ultimate destination of this, which was like a JSON file? Um, that could be rendered by the browser, and having to just kind of think through that was 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 pretty I don't know pretty important to actually getting the quality of the of of, of the thing I wanted. It would, it would have been very easy for me to just go in, jump into in the dynamic you know flexible language, just start code, coding without making things happen and finding myself in a corner. Um, Hass will prevent you from doing right. that often at the, the cost of upfront frustration, <laughs> but. The, it's it's kind of like this thing that exactly. eventually um, right. you you're like I, you know I'm right. I'm so happy you made me eat my vegetables all all those years, <laughs> uh, uh, whether or not I thought it was the best idea at the time. But um, yeah, it, it just you know another good example of of how I like to Haskell makes me think in different ways is um, I was going through this uh, really good um, blog post or or maybe it was a paper I'm not sure, but about how um, about how cell automata. Um, can be kind of modeled as uh, co-monads in Haskell. And, um, um, you know, and what happens there is rather than trying to model the thing, right, the cell automata itself, right, what all you model, model is the effects of one state on the next state, right? Um, basically, how the universe, how you walk through the universe, the universe of possible states, right? And that abstraction at first seems unnecessarily cerebral, right? You think of, oh, it's very easy to model cell automata. They're actually the number one like com computer modeling thing, right? That's like what we've been doing in computers forever, right? But by by thinking about the process first, by which you move from one state to the next, you can start to introduce more sophisticated level levels of abstraction, um, such as what happens if this process process gets interrupted. Well, how how can this process be you know be made concurrent? How can this process be you know um, kind of mutated? And and once you start to think of things on the process level level like that, you can get some really cool cool and powerful abstractions. Um, you know, uh, I, I wish I had a better example of. Production code that has has needed that kind of level of level of thought, but just in my personal Haskell experiments, um, it's been pretty tremendously uh, powerful in that sense.